Hello, this is Gary Chahot welcoming you to check out the French History Podcast. Our main show covers the history of France from the first humans until present and has currently reached the reign of Charlemagne. If you liked Mike Duncan's The History of Rome and wanted a similar program covering the land of beauty, culture, and love, we are exactly that. We also host world-renowned scholars who have delivered guest episodes on their specialties, including 18th century pirates, revolutionary booksellers in 20th century Paris, the special friendship between the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, and numerous others. Learn what you love and listen to the French History Podcast today. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 15. The Root and Branch Reforms. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Last time, we saw how the Earl of Strafford, Thomas Wentworth, tried to defend himself from charges of treason. Strafford did a spectacular job at this, helped by the shoddiness of his enemy's case. The Puritan opposition, led by notorious arsehole John Pym in the House of Commons and by twelve peers in the House of Lords, attempted to argue that Strafford's career was one long list of crimes and misdemeanours which could and should be viewed as treason. As we saw, Strafford did a fine job disputing many of the charges brought before him, and he questioned the legitimacy of their entire approach. What precedent did it set, he argued, if two dozen charges spread over a decade of service could amount to a charge of treason? Treason had very specific requirements, requirements which Strafford persuasively argued he did not meet. So after Strafford spent weeks deflecting and dodging the charges of his enemies, his enemies pulled the rug out from underneath him and brought a bill of attainder against him. Essentially, both Houses of Parliament would vote on whether Strafford was guilty. In the tumultuous weeks of April and May 1641, After rumours and evidence of military conspiracies, the riling up of the people of London, the threatening and libelling of Strafford's sympathisers, the bill of attainder passed. And after a weekend of troubled deliberation, with the threat of the mob hanging over him and his family, Charles I signed the death warrant of his loyal counsellor, and Strafford was executed on Tower Hill. In this episode, it's important to note what was happening in London while King and Parliament struggled. Firstly, the sitting of Parliament, the collapse of censorship controls, and the, let's call it, interesting times which London has found themselves in, led to an explosion of the book trade, which only increased in the following years. Whereas in the 1630s, the average number of publications were around 450 a year, in 1640, this number doubled to about 850. In 1641, the number had doubled again to over 2,000. And in 1642, it doubled again to more than 4,000. Now, I hear you wondering, why are you talking about books? Aside from the flourishing of English political and literary culture, which this explosion demonstrated, which I'm sure we'll cover in a future episode, many of these were targeting people at the time. They, alongside political pamphlets and broadsides, and supplemented by preaching, they poured scorn on, for example, Strafford and the other champions of personal rule. If you were wondering how the people of London had been roused to such anger that they would threaten members of Parliament and invade the royal palace of Whitehall, this helps explain it. As Harris puts it, quote, The bitter and hateful tone of much of the invective was such as to inflame public passions and inspired hatred 
and a desire for revenge. End quote. Secondly, beginning in spring 1641 and continuing throughout the summer, plague once again returned to the streets of London. This was both the plague, capital T, capital P, Yersinia pestis, the Black Death, as well as another ever present pestilence, smallpox. As we shall see, the Great Leveller will have a part to play. For some in Parliament, Strafford's removal was simply a necessary measure to bring about the reconciliation between king and subject, to bring the relationship back into alignment. Now that his tyrannical influence was gone, along with his head, Charles would surely see reason and good governance could return to the kingdoms. Well, about that. Charles was outraged by the attainder of Strafford and never forgave those responsible for his death, himself included. As we shall see this episode and in future episodes, the relationship between King and Parliament had not turned a corner, and this was not the start of a productive working relationship. Because, while Strafford's fall further divided the King and his opponents, his opponents, sometimes called the Junto, or the Puritan opposition, lost one of their more moderate voices. Three days before Strafford met the Headsman's Axe on Tower Hill, Francis Russell, the fourth Earl of Bedford, died of smallpox. Bedford had been integral to the Junto's plans over the previous few years. He had been, for example, one of the commissioners who'd negotiated the Treaty of Ripon with the Covenanters, and he'd been one of those appointed to the Privy Council by Charles early in 1641. Bedford had had the stature and political skill needed to reach a compromise with the king, or at least he believed so. Edward Hyde was an MP in the Long Parliament and one of the more moderate critics of Charles at this stage. Writing after the Restoration, 20 years later, when he was now the Earl of Clarendon, he recalled Bedford as such. The Earl of Bedford, a wise man, and of too great and plentiful a fortune, to wish a subversion of the government, and it quickly appeared that he only intended to make himself and his friends great at court, not at all to lessen the court itself. In other words, Bedford wanted a seat at the table. He didn't want to change the table or smash the table into firewood. Conrad Russell, in his biography of his distant ancestor, is scathing of Bedford's legacy. Despite the respect he had won, the commons adjourned so members could attend his funeral, the only time this honour was bestowed under the early Stuarts, quote, Great honour was no substitute for success. For many years, Bedford was remembered as the man who might have prevented civil war. He might have done, but he did not, end quote. After the death of Strafford and Bedford, Parliament enacted some financial reforms. £400,000 was granted to the king, and in June, a poll tax was established to pay the cost of disbanding the armies of the Royalists and the Covenanters. Further, tonnage and poundage, that old thorn in the side of the relationship between Charles and Parliament, was tied to the Triennial Act. It would only be granted for three years, to be renewed at each Parliament, and to be collected on the authority of Parliament. All the while, the fallout of the failed army plots was used to further pressure the king about his evil counsellors. So, for those keeping score at home, Charles no longer had the authority to unilaterally dissolve the current parliament, a parliament would be summoned every three years with or without his consent, and parliament had taken control of one of his most lucrative sources of revenue. In July, things went further and the hated symbols and instruments of personal rule, the courts of High Chamber and Star Chamber, were abolished. They were followed by an act which declared that the Hamden case, the famed ship money trial of 1637, which had narrowly found in favour of ship money's legality, well, now that judgment was void, and ship money decreed unlawful. The fines for distraint of knighthood for failing to attend royal events to be knighted, were likewise abolished, and the royal forests were fixed to their extent in James VI and I's reign. One after another, 
the methods by which Charles had funded his personal rule were cut away, discarded like the medieval relics they were. This was a modern kingdom after all. But it wasn't all going Parliament's way. As Richard Cust notes, aside from these developments, Charles's critics in Parliament were suddenly finding themselves on the defensive. The key counterweight to Charles's resistance to their reforms had disappeared. The Army of the Covenant had, with the Treaty of London, withdrawn back across the border and been disbanded. Also, the Junto now found out the poisoned chalice of politics. As Cust puts it, they, quote, began to experience the unpopularity which went with exercising power, end quote. Not only was the poll tax widely resented, but the agenda to abolish episcopacy was not as widely popular as the Puritan opposition had hoped. Because while all of these high political shenanigans were going on, and Lord was being arrested, and Strafford was losing his head, Parliament had also taken aim at the religious reforms of the past decade. Back in November 1640, the Root and Branch Petition, as it was known, collected 15,000 signatures from London, and despite the urging of those in Parliament who were trying to prioritise the political battles, it was widely published in December, and presented to Parliament on the 11th. A month later, on the 13th of January, the counties of Essex and Kent both presented their own petitions in the same style as London's. By the start of February, another 11 counties had followed suit, and by the end of 1641, 19 counties from across England had followed London's example. But what were these root and branch petitions about? The name comes from the London petitions urging that the, quote, government of archbishops and lord bishops, deans and archdeacons, with all its dependencies, roots and branches, may be abolished, end quote. These petitions took aim at the bishops. On the 19th of December 1640, the Commons established a committee to examine the church and invited petitions and testimony from across England and Wales. From December to June, almost a thousand accounts of drunkenness, sexual impropriety, and of course, suspected popery and ceremonialism came into this committee. And the committee, in what Harris calls a, quote, quasi-judicial function that was unprecedented, end quote, began to punish these wrongdoers. Many were stripped of their incomes and removed from their posts. The sheer number of complaints coming forward added fuel to the fire, regardless of the quality or reality of the charges. Clearly, as some MPs in several pamphlets cried out, the government of the Church of England was fundamentally flawed. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A. B-B-E-L dot com, code Recorded History, Babel Language for Life. A further wave of iconoclasm 
echoing or perhaps continuing the anti-Laudian rage of the previous summer, spread out across England. Particularly in areas of strong Calvinist or Puritan leanings, we see similar acts to the summer of 1640. Altar railings were pulled out, images burnt, and even people were targeted. In the occupied north, Covenanter troops were sometimes at the forefront of these acts, such as at Easington in the county of Durham, where the Scots destroyed a marble baptismal font, broke the communion table, and burnt the Book of Common Prayer. Then, they forced two men to wear surplices taken from the church. The two men, unwillingly cosplaying as William Lord and Bishop Matthew Wren, were then beaten. Catholics and ceremonialists were targeted by mobs throughout England. In Essex, a curate was beaten by a crowd for crossing a child during a baptism. In Berkshire, the house of a known Catholic was raided, and his quote-unquote idols were taken and burnt. The victorious and godly crowd then marched on the home of a woman who had successfully prosecuted a man for sexual assault. To the mob, her attacker was an quote, honest man, end quote, and she was a, quote, common whore, end quote. The woman was berated and threatened by the mob until confessing that her accusation was false. Then, with their confession in hand, the mob took the woman and threw her into a well, where Catholics collected holy water. Quote, now, when the papist come for holy water, instead of holy water, they shall have whore's water. Despite the image that all this might conjure of a kingdom in a consensus against the bishops and Lordianism, it was far from cut and dry. At this stage, Parliament was divided on exactly how far to go. Some, including the hotter sort of Protestant, felt their reforming zeal rise to even greater heights, as testimony followed petition followed pamphlet, describing all the ways that the current church was corrupt. As these radicals became increasingly radicalised, there were others in both houses of parliament that watched them with caution. These, let's call them moderates or even conservatives, were a substantial minority in the commons and a substantial majority in the lords. So when the London petition came before the commons, it led to a two-day debate between the two sides. Some, like Sir Benjamin Rudyard, argued against the petition, warning that such a course might lead to even more extreme innovations. He argued instead for the episcopacy to be reformed, to be cleansed of the corruption while keeping the institution itself. Opposing this position, and arguing the cause of the petition, were men such as Nathaniel Fiennes, younger brother to Lord Say and Seely, in case we needed any reminder about how closely linked many of the players in this saga are. Fine said that bishops were the, quote, seed of superstition, and they, quote, relied on popish miracles. The debate resulted in a stalemate of sorts, with the petition referred to a committee, while the House would reserve judgment on the episcopacy itself. In the aftermath of this debate, on the 26th of February 1641, notorious arsehole John Pym brought charges against Lord in the House of Lords. He had, quote, traitorously assumed to himself a papal and tyrannical power, both in an ecclesiastical and temporal matters over his majesty's subjects, end quote. And on the 1st of March, the Lords ordered Lord's removal to the Tower of London, where we left him. He'll stay there for a while, so don't worry if you forget about him. Parliament certainly seems to. It was the Upper House which stemmed the tide of Episcopal reform throughout the summer. The King had earlier made clear that he would not countenance the abolition of the bishops, and the Lords were sympathetic. They blocked two bills from the Commons, the first of which was to exclude the bishops from Parliament, and the second to abolish them entirely. With the publication of the Protestation in early May came another wave of iconoclasm, and another source of friction between the two houses. After altar rails were torn out in Southwark, the Lords ordered those responsible to pay to restore them. Others, who had disturbed a church service, were fined and imprisoned on their orders. 
But these punishments did nothing to halt the movement, and church wardens across London began preemptively removing their own rails to head off any unrest. The Commons then declared that church wardens were authorised to do so, and in September, after a lengthy debate, the Commons approved a recommendation ordering church wardens to remove altar rails, images, crucifixes, candlesticks, move communion tables back to where they'd been, and to stop bowing and scraping at the name of Christ, along with other decidedly Puritan reforms. At one stroke, they were rolling back many of the Laudian reforms of the past decade. When the Commons went to publish the order, they invited the Lords to partner with them in this godly crusade. Instead, the Lords published its own order, from January of that year, which declared that services should proceed as instituted by Acts of Parliament, and threatened those who disturbed these services with punishment. This is not what the Commons wanted at all, and so they condemned the Lord's Order and published their own anyway. The reaction to the Commons Order was mixed. Some parishes eagerly took up the charge, while others refused to follow the lower house and instead accepted the Lord's Order. Perhaps surprisingly, even parishes with strong Puritan leanings weren't guaranteed to follow the commons. Only a third of the London parishes, of which records survive, took action based on the commons order, and this was London. London was one of, if not the, most Puritan city in England. Elsewhere, riots erupted in order to protect particularly treasured churches from their own clergy. For example, in Kidderminster, when the wardens attempted to enforce the new order, parishioners raised the alarm and gathered en masse, and armed, to stop them. But of course, there were plenty of cases where the Commons Order was taken up with destructive enthusiasm, often far exceeding their instructions. That the Commons had apparently sponsored this wave of iconoclasm turned many moderates and conservatives firmly against them. Combined with resentment over the poll tax, the increasingly polarised Commons were far from universally popular. That is where we will leave off this week. Next time, we will follow Charles on his second trip to Scotland since he left as a young child. His last visit in 1633 hadn't been a tour de force. This time would go better, and he would win his Scottish subjects to his side. Provided, of course, that there wasn't any kind of incident. Before I go, I'm excited to announce the start of a project I've been working on for the past couple of months. This week will mark the beginning of the Scottish Revolution interview series. Since before the new year, I've been interviewing historians of the Scottish Revolution. So this week, and every week, for at least the next three months, I'll be bringing a range of topics to your ears. How the Covenanters governed Scotland while they were in power. Why the Scots didn't follow the English in declaring a republic how Covenanters experienced and pursued their faith, and so, so much more. The work of many of these scholars has appeared in Pax Britannica already, and I'm thrilled that so many gave up their free time to speak with me. I've had a great time producing this series, and if it's well received, I hope to do similar ones in the future. And for those to whom interviews aren't usually your thing, don't worry, these are all in addition to normally scheduled episodes. Though, of course, I highly recommend giving them a listen anyway. I should also announce that you can now buy Pax Britannica merchandise. Now, you might be thinking, wouldn't this have made more sense to release before Christmas? And yes, yes it would. As of recording, the choice of merch you can get is limited to one mug, but I'm going to be expanding the range over the near future. There's a link to the store in the episode description and on the website, or you can go to teespring.com slash stores slash Pax hyphen Britannica. Thank you to my House of Lords, including but not limited to my royal favourites Mike Sanders and Owen Cotton, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, the Duke of Ormond, Brendan Bonner. They are joined by the Marquess of Ludlow, Nick Robinson, and Earl John of Losenford. If you'd like to join their ranks and receive ad-free versions of this and every other episode, go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and of course, as always, to you for listening. <laughs>